Yeah, I think it's in my tablet. Hi, so uh, welcome to uh, uh, Pathogen, an introduction by Andrew Morgan and Antoine Amand. Uh, Antoine, I guess, just woke up in uh, New York or somewhere in Eastern time, and Andrew is chiming in from London. And uh, I'm Rajesh Sainadeen. Uh, I am uh, sort of coordinating this project. And here we have uh, Alvin, Alvin Toft Press's PhD student. And uh, Ong Nyo. Ong Nyo? Okay. Can you introduce yourself again? Oh, hi, hello. Uh, I'm Wang Yue. Uh, I'm studying uh, data science of Uppsala University. I'm doing the uh, financial streaming project with Virginia and Ruflia. Yeah, nice to meet you. Next student. Uh, <laughs> hi, uh, this is Rafaelia. I'm also doing the master's uh, in uh, data science in Uppsala University. And currently, uh, I'm working on the financial streams project under Raz's uh, supervision. Um, hi, my name is Virginia, and I'm like the other two of my um, teammates. I'm working in this, I'm studying this uh, master in data science and working in the financial stream project. Uh, very nice to meet you all. Very nice to meet you too. Nice to meet you. Do you want to say one or two sentences about yourself, Andrew and Antoine? Okay, uh, I'll start. Antoine looks like he's having coffee. Uh, so I'm Andrew Morgan, and I've been working in data since, well, I was excited about big data in the early 90s. And by the time I got my proper jobs in it, it was the late 90s. And um, I always saw myself as a kind of a data scientist, but I didn't know what that was because we didn't know what that was back then. So I've been working in data now for 20, feels like 25 years. I'm like the old man of data. Um, and I did a lot of things in data science with Antoine and others, and we learned a lot about how to study data and how to extract insights from data during that time. So I'm an author, you guys probably heard, and um, yeah, kind of a chief data engineer at the moment with a big team. And Antoine? Similar kind of background uh, from, uh, from Andrew. So Andrew came from all the geospatial uh, type of, of things. I came from a uh, an astrophysics background. And back then, my master's degree was called Statistical Analysis of Astronomical Data. That simply means data science on big data. But I didn't know that back then. So my job has always been to bridge the gap between software engineering and data science. And I've been passionate about putting the business value first and looking at how technology can help address those type of use cases. So my job is at Databricks as a technical director for financial services to do exactly that, to bridge the gap between business and technology using data science. Awesome. So um, Antoine and Andrew, you have the floor, so share your screen or anything. So the idea is to get some insight into your sort of pathogen uh, baby or whatever you want to call this. All right. I'm so Maybe, so Antoine and I haven't really had a chance to collaborate before this meeting. Okay, I put one slide together that tells the introduction to what we're trying to do. Yeah. Okay, Antoine, and then maybe i let you take the floor for a bit. Yeah, sure. Sounds okay. good to me. All right, let me just make sure I got the right window up for you guys. Okay, um, I'll just do my desktop and I hope I don't show you loads of stuff that's irrelevant. Uh, okay, so let's just do this and hit play there. Okay, so Antoine and his code base really implements ideas that have come from a long range of thinking about how we get into understanding causation, right, from a whole range of data sets. Um, and there's this idea of causal network and having causal networks and so the learning after 25 years is that you can apply algorithms to data to generate value. Okay, you can run a page rank. That's a valuable, you know, derivative of, of a social graph. Um, and if I gave you a data set, it would have an archetypal data st sort of structure. So I could give you video data, or I could give you unstructured text, or I could give you time series, or I could give you a graph, and I could give you events. So these are all archetypes. And we had a model that we used 
many years ago that said, how do we add value through you know, data operations? And one of the value streams is that you can run a schema transition, which means you convert one of these things into one of the other ones. So you convert time series into events, or you convert events into time series, right? You, you can do various things. And when you make those transitions in the data, when you do that transformation from one archetype to another, the algorithms designed for that new thing that you've created are going to be available to you for the first time. So as an example, if we turn a video and we count events of people walking by the video into a time series and uh, we have a people counter, that time series, we can now apply time series forecasting methods to understanding that data, where previously we would just use image processing techniques. So this is a very powerful way to create surprising new insights that people weren't expecting, okay? So what is this project that Antoine and I worked on? Um, so many years ago, I learned a technique called trend calculus, and it takes a time series and it does a piecewise linear regression, a proxy for one, and it turns a time series into events. Now you can see here the major highs and lows on the stock market, okay? So these are the blue events, and it builds up to this from small events. So we have lots of small events of highs and lows, then you see slightly larger ones, and then you see slightly larger ones in red, and then you finally get these major events in blue. And each time you step from a low uh, sequence to a higher sequence of event type, um, we could call that a stream order, right? So there's a law of Horton, Horton's law. It comes from geophysics, which is what Antoine suggested. <laughs> My background is. So in geophysics, Horton's stream orders are orders of magnitude um, in branching of, of river networks. So major tributaries of rivers and smaller, smaller ones and smaller ones. So we think of these as those things. Now, when I convert a time series to events, I can now apply a lot of logic to the events that I wouldn't be able to normally apply to time series because there's a lot of algorithms designed for events. And connected events here as lines, we could call those waves, for example, or trends. And we could start to analyze the average length of a trend. So if we notice a big event like a low, what is the average time it takes to climb to the end of that event? So these are durations, and that's a different archetype of data. Now, another thing, and this is when I explained this to Antoine years ago, he had the insight to then say, well, actually, I, I love graphs. What if I connected this little blue dot here to all other blue dots on other different time series happening inside a window around it? So all of its nearby neighbors in time would be connected. And we would then create a connected um, cause, well, we call that a graph of causal candidates. So these are candidate causality rules, just splashed across hundreds or thousands of time series. And this huge network that's filled with noise and coincidences um, would then emerge. And then the question is, how do we filter out the coincidences and leave behind the things that are high frequency so that we have a very strong set of causal candidates? And then finally, from these causal candidates, how do we then generate something and use models for example, I've got here a fuzzy cognitive map. And in this, in this, we don't just have connections, we have causal relations. And the relation here is that, you know, when profits, to, you know, if there's more police interdiction, there's less profits, right? So it's a, it's a signed relationship and it kind of tells you about how causal, causality and changing one thing can lead to changes in another. And this tells us about how financial systems might work and how financial contagions could spread. And the idea here is how do we get from raw time series to something like that? Okay, so I think that's basically the introduction. Antoine. Yes, uh, I absolutely love how, you, how you've introduced about changing that dimension from a time series to an event base will lead to all the different type of tools and techniques. Um, I absolutely love that. I think that's one of the reasons I was so obsessed with the world of big data and technology back, back then is then technology is no longer a constraint. It's the only constraint you have is your imagination, the creativity. <laughs> so it's effectively being as blunt and as creative as you can to effectively transform some raw signal into actionable insights and using the right method and technology to apply on this. 
So uh, to give you a bit of background, and I can I have a few slides that I retrieved from from uh, hold on. Uh, let me share that. Here you go. So I worked on that about six or seven years ago, probably. Um, I had the chance to attend a competition called Texata. That was the Big Data World Championship. And the, the competition is quite apparently quite simple. It's a four hours case study where they say, here is all of my data. In four hours, you need to come up with insights and pitch that solution from a business perspective. So in four hours, you need to understand what you could derive from the data sets, explore, come up with a solution and think in terms of the business value, how it applies for those specific industries. So I had the chance to participate in 2014 and 2015, and the data set was from Cisco Software Defined Network. Any single incident that happened in Cisco's network over a course of 10 years. That was like millions of IT service management incidents. Someone opens a ticket and says that application does not work, and someone closed that ticket like two months later. Someone opens a ticket and say, I can connect to that database. Someone opens that ticket, just close that problem, and so on and so forth. So you get those, those millions of potential events mentioning some potential failures for each and every single application at Cisco. And my view was interesting. So thinking of this from that, that simple code here, that butterfly effect, could the a specific issue be propagated and be a, a causal link to another application. To put that another way, if some application just keeps fading, what is the likelihood of that failure to be uh, causing that specific application to, uh, to, to fail? So we looked at those different incidents. So you see on the right hand side, an incident has been raised, the ticket has been closed. An incident has been raised, the ticket has been closed. Those are isolated events. But when you start effectively thinking and linking those and converting those, as per, per uh, Andrew's point, into a graph-based model, then we can start potentially looking at those causal links. So let's just assume for a second, A happened and A caused B to fail. A happened and caused C to fail and so on and so forth. And you start building that graph. So it may be wrong, and you may be thinking, oh, correlation does not imply causation, and there is be a lot of noise, and, and you would be absolutely right. But for the time being, let's just assume that this is the case. And if we start building that model, if we start building that graph, we could try to detect uh, potential causal links by propagating that risk over all those millions of nodes and vertices and edges. And that simple see the simulation and visualization here is what I did at that competition, being able to sort those applications by the risk of contagion, risk of propagating a failure downstream. Imagine if something happens, now just walking backwards from that, imagine with the kind of, of, of um, in real life scenario, something happens on a database, the that database just is off for a couple of hours. Obviously, some application will fail. Some application will fail, some processes will fail, some processes will not be allowed, will not be able to, to, to write data back to a database. That will have downstream effects. So any single outage at some point may have some downstream effects. And when you start thinking of that causal link and start propagating that link through all those different scenarios, then you could effectively rank those applications by the risk, the, 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 the risk of those different um, uh, applications to, to fail. And this is what we call the sensitivity or the aggressivity. And I can come back to those two concepts here. 
But linking all those different groups, then you can also start thinking in terms of communities. There will be groups of application closely uh, packed together. You will have groups of connections only connected by specific hubs. And I thought maybe there are some applications that are the kind of center of those communities. Maybe that's huge database that process all your CRM data. Maybe that small application that process of your legal or billing or whatever, whatever, uh, whatever uh, type of applications. And you can start potentially thinking of, OK, let's just imagine if that database fails. Two days later, maybe all those different applications will fail. Maybe three days later, maybe that will reach those specific hubs. And when that reaches those specific hubs, that potentially spread that kind of issue of failure to other communities, to other parts of the network that were not touched by this outage in the first place. So we can start really having fun of playing with those causal links and propagating those risks across that fuzzy cognitive maps, as, as uh, Andrew mentioned. And I looked at this from the IT service management. You can start looking at this from GDELT, as I'm sure that uh, working with RAS, you're already looking at, at this data set here. What's the likelihood of that specific event happening in, in Venezuela? And what's the, the cause it may have in the trade of coffee beans or whatever it may be? Thinking of the contagion in terms of political stability in the country, thinking of healthcare, of customer care, or any other business. In fact, I was looking at this from the concept of potentially, why not even creating my startup back in 2017? And you will see a few things here. The same concept of ranking events. Uh, Antoine, not, yes. are you sure this is confidential? No, it's confidential. Yeah, thank you. And it's, I know it's recorded. This is absolutely fine. I will not do that anyway. Um, <laughs> yes, I wanted to, 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 to create a startup. But anyway, the thing is, there are two concepts, aggressiveness and sensitivity. And the reason I want to show you those two is because you will see that in the code base. If I have a page rank, and if I look at that correlation, that contagion study that will propagate from one node to another, I will find how likely one specific event will be spreading that downstream. If I look at sensitivity, that taking that graph and reverse it, that will be how likely one specific node may be subject to any random event. And you can start effectively linking, understand the correlation, the causation of all of this. You can start looking at how those different events may happen. And, and I looked at this from a financial standpoint, financial con con contagion. I looked at this from a reinsurance. I looked at this from an IT service management or a cyber risk. There are plenty of different things when you start effectively converting those raw signal into graph. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I had the code. I can show you the code quickly so that you're not necessarily. Um, before we jump to the code, let's ask if there's any questions about the concepts. If you flash your pictures back up for just a second, well, well, maybe we we go back to turning off the sharing. You queue it up, and then we'll um, just open the floor up about yeah, that. Yeah, good point. By the way, Liam just joined us. He's uh, the ass assistant professor from the Royal Institute of Technology, who specializes in causal inference. Liam, this is Andrew and Antoine, and you missed the be beginning, but uh, it's going to be on YouTube shortly. Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, thanks for the invite, and uh, my apologies for being late. Another meeting ran substantially over, but uh, nice to meet y'all. So. Nice to meet you. So any, any question with the approach? So we have 23 minutes before Antoine has a hard, hard stop, but Andrew will be here a bit longer. So I have a quick question about the, the extracting pathogen graph, the number five. So yeah, that one. So that's the parent and the child, right? And you're just visualizing this. Yes. 
And then uh, you had another one, right? The the whatever the one that said confidential. There you had some other uh, graphs, right? The other slide deck you had. By the way, could you share these slide decks as uh, PDFs? And it's just the representation. If you start zooming in, you see. Yeah. Oh, can I zoom in on this? So you oh, see, I see how I try to link also back the communities. So when you start building a communities network, so community detection on that large network, maybe that will be all the database related type of applications. Mm -hmm. Type of applications, maybe that's all the legal, whatever, or billing systems. So you start seeing that those potential nodes are closely packed together in that graph. And when something happens into that type of family of applications, oh that may have a downstream impact all over your network. Oh, OK. When so for you example, may see some isolated events, maybe that one specifically, if that happened, that will only apply to that specific community. So, so let's we have an incident, right, that's recorded by the police. And there was a person who got bitten by a dog. So what we want to do is we want to understand the class of incident. So we want to be able to understand the statistics about all people getting bitten by all dogs, right? So there's a community, right, of things going on, and there's a pattern. So as we can just statistics about all the kinds of candidates. Oh, did I drop out? So yeah, a little I, bit. So I'm just saying that if you generalize all the specific events into a community, that's another mechanism for generalizing the statistics between the communities and yep. understanding community risk um but yeah individual um events will always be highly specific and, and it's the general causal candidates that we're trying to establish yeah i mean i think in the interest of time what will be good to, put is to jump into the code base so because that's the hardest for us and then we can figure out the, the yeah. language later yeah just to, to shed some light on what, what Andrew mentioned, but in the concept of that graph, this is, you can think of this, this is the exact same representation as what I had before. So this is just a nice way to visualize oh. graph here. If something happens to that specific node, this one that if you see my mouse, then that obviously is going to affect many other downstream communities. Mm -hmm. If something happened to that tiny little node here, that may only affect its close neighbors. Yeah. So coming back to uh, pathogen GitHub, oh, where is it? Uh, sticking among pathogen, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh, that's when my name is Amend GitHub. Yes, go ahead. Uh, oh, there it sorry, is. it was there, but I can find that here. GDL Spark Pathogen. So, Pathogen. Uh, I haven't used it for a while. So, there is a good chance that it may not necessarily work with latest technologies. I can see Spark 2.1. Uh, so still Scala 2.11, so it will not work with the latest version of Spark, but someone could easily recompile it. Yeah, we'll start with 2.11 and 2.10 because I'll, I'll get them into Docker development mode, just like Johannes did. Okay. So Use the same palm file and, and, and then yeah, Good. go to the okay. later version later. So we have those two concepts in the code. Uh, for lack of better name, we call that the rooster and the sunrise, because that whole idea of his, uh, the rooster crows immediately before the sunrise, the rooster causes the sun to rise. That's this correlation versus causation. The first part of the algorithm is contextualize those events into a graph, contextualize those time series into events and into a graph. The second part is effectively running all those causal links and that page rank to be able to infer that aggressiveness, what I call this aggressiveness and sensitivity. So every event will be how likely this event could explain downstream effects. And for every event is how likely that event will result from any random upstream cause. 
So if I go back to the code, you should be able to find that rooster and send package. So the rooster without getting necessary. If I'm not mistaken, I wrap that into a case class called events and I return a graph. And that graph will have a specific vertex that contains specific attributes and uh, uh, an edge that contains that weight of that of that causal link, as as Andrew mentioned in the in the fuzzy cognitive map. So any event will be linked to many others with a specific way. So to to summarize, the crow is a uh, is actually a, a, a Scala function whose input is a resilient distributed data set of events of type some case class event, and it outputs. I guess uh, a graph, uh, and is this a graphics graph, right? Yes, it's a graphics. It's a graphics graph. Okay. Uh, I think it would be quite difficult to push that to a graph frames, given that I may be doing some really complex pregol call. No, no, um, graphics is fine. They will learn how to how to program in graphics next week. Okay, that's so module that's zero zero two girls. So I don't remember exactly how the code is packaged, but uh, the first thing is converting an event into those overlaps. Remember that PowerPoint where you see an event start time and a stop time and being able to link one specific event with, uh, with other events. So I will be exploding my events into a specific granularity. So between a start date and the end date, I will be able to create those kind of tickets, those kind of ticks, and being able to say every single event that shares at least one tick will be linked together. And that will start creating my edges. Um, so that means for each event, you already need a begin time and an end time somehow. Yes, I need that dimension anyway, because I will need to understand that those could potentially be two candidates to link together. Um, blah, blah, blah. The second important concept in that specific class is that first causality link. So anyone thinking of causation correlation will just look at my graph and say that this is not causal at all. At all. To understand the true causal link, I will need to effectively potentially generate some, some noise, generate some random connections to see whether or not this is a true causal link or just a simple correlation or a simple simple uh, simple coincidence so what i'm doing is i'm taking the same event but this time i'm completely scrambling the start date and, and, and end date i'm completely like randomizing my entire set and just connecting randomly those different events together and the reason I'm doing that is that stochastic process will allow me to understand what's a true signal compared to just random noise. And that is exactly what I'm doing here so that my edges will be from a simple, from a specific event to a specific event. And that's a signal over noise attribute. You're still with me? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I kind of am. Okay, no, I'm going to try to explain this in plain English. Uh -huh. All right, really plain English. There's millions of potential events, right? And what they are is they're just things that happen. Okay, you could infer an end date or you could get an, a duration. It doesn't really matter. Now, once we then say just after this happened, that happened, we create a coincidence and that's an edge in the original graph. And so there could be a billion coincidences. And then we start to then aggregate them up and count up the frequency of these coincidences by their class, right? Man gets bitten by dog, right? So we, we or rooster and sunrise, we start to aggregate these up and collect statistics. And then we need something to compare them to. So what we do is Antoine is creating a totally random graph, completely randomized. And then he's collecting statistics about what does random coincidences look like? And once we understand the frequency of random coincidences in our network, then we can say, well, maybe the count of frequency in this is much, much different than random. 
In other words, it's too frequent to be a coincidence, right? So you start to think, well, if it's happening a hundred times and I expect from probability, it should be 12 times, what's going on here? This is a much stronger causal relationship candidate than just random coincidences. But we needed to have a comparison so we could understand the difference between how to filter out all of the noise effectively. Does that make more sense? Maybe I made it worse. <laughs> yeah, so I have a question. So in this framework, is this say, so there's an event like a uh, dog bites man, and there's an event like a uh, rooster crows sunrise, so the two events. And of course there's gonna be lots and lots of events, but in that collection of events, are there multiple occurrences of rooster crows and sunrises? Yes. And dog yes. I see, and then when you do the randomizations, uh, are you are you keeping any other elements of the graph fixed or are you completely, because there are many no, ways to we, randomize. We keep the exact same event and we randomize those links. Okay, so the events are placed in time as they were in the original data, right? But then, so, no, you're so actually you are, moving you, them You can time. think of this as I have two graphs. I have the graph where all those events are linked with the actual start time and end time. That's, that's, my, that's my, uh, my first graph. My second graph is the same event, but this time completely randomized in terms of start date, end date. And then I'm overlaying those two and find how many times did that event really occur versus uh, just a... a um, a random coincidence. Okay, okay. Right, right, right. But I guess, okay, that randomization strategy does allow for me to take physical constraints on the length of the interval of certain types of yes. events, right? That's yes. fine. So it, it can be like sort of rationally constrained randomizations. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, and feel free to modify this. Honestly, that was just one attempt and the code, I mean, yeah. I, when, when is the last time I've updated that code? Okay, and then uh, what's, uh, what's the other uh, package? This is Rooster, right? And then what's so this the is other Rooster. One? A few things that are quite were well, quite difficult. I remember when you start randomizing everything, as you know, in Spark and RDD's world, and everything is is lazy evaluated. Meaning that if you run that same package twice, or if you call that same data frame twice, you may end up with complete different random nodes. And that's why it's key to set your seed strategy so that randomization will be consistent. So that's the only okay. thing. That's, so these are the, the these are the MD5 hashes that seed each partition for the downstream hash partitioning strategy, correct? Uh, that's to to seed the randomization of the start date and end date. Oh, I see. Okay. Because if I do run some statistic, I will be calling that graph twice and I will end up with a complete different random values. You need to make sure that all those randomization are at least consistent. Now, Antoine, maybe clarify for me. When we first thought about these ideas, we thought about running that Monte Carlo simulation of the graph um, many, many, many times so we could build a body of statistics about what a coincidence looks like. And then, yeah. no, then we can have a normal curve around what, a, what is normally a coincidence. Exactly. And then, that we was the point. The, then we compare the actual connections we derive from the data against this uh, underlying denominator of random coincidence. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly, exactly the point. So yeah. you build a graph. Now, this time you have as an entry point, you have a graph. A graph of pathogen, I don't remember exactly what's in that vertex class, but just a few, few statistics, and we can open that class later. But the second package is that sun. So sun takes a graph of pathogen and just extract a graph of pathogen. But this time with these scores of sensitivity and aggressiveness. So when you start building that causal graph, well, the first thing is, why don't we start with a simple page rank? And a simple page rank, oops. Mm. Um, ba, 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 ba. Uh, for some reason, I'm not doing a simple page rank. I'm doing my own Pregel call. 
I don't remember why, because, oh, because I want to use the weight, the weight of those links that I've computed before. PageRank does not care about the edge weight. PageRank just looks at the incoming and outgoing connections. I need to start taking. Yeah. It's a, it's a weighted page rank. That I, we computed in the first place. So I had to create my own page rank. Yeah. Um, so what happens when you get all those, the, the first graph and you run page rank? That will give you the importance of a node, the influence of a node in that graph. Because everything is from an event A to an event B, page rank. Uh -oh. that that node is most likely to fail or that node is most likely to happen based on the surrounding context. If I reverse that graph and I run exactly the same, this time is not A is connected to B, but it's more B is connected to A. So a node that is influent in that context means a node that is most likely to spread its events to downstream causes, to downstream events. So that will be the sensitivity and the aggressiveness. Being able to join those two and wrap that into that case class that we say this, this pathogen will contain my normalized aggressiveness, my normalized sensitivity, and that's exactly what this, uh, this, this code does. So, so Antoine, there's never been a better time to explain this to people, right? So. Oh no, this is just such an infrastructure screw up. Sorry, right. because you're going to sorry, the internet to connection is very bad people. here. So sorry, can you repeat what you just said? So with COVID, if you have a positive test, you're highly contagious. Yeah. If you're an old person over 80, you're highly vulnerable. Yeah. So by running the networks forward and backwards. Antoine's able to find people that are highly vulnerable, in other words, sensitive to other people. And he's also able to find people that are highly contagious, meaning they have an impact on many others. Mm, that's very interesting. I see, I see the reversal meaning now, I think. I By the way, there was a class uh, that you said you will get into, but you didn't. What was that, the output of that? Uh... Uh, it's not here as far as I can see. Uh, I think it's just the Was vertex a, class. Oh. Uh, oh, so okay. uh, an event, so an event has a specific ID. So we call it an event or concept sometimes. So a concept has an ID, a start time, a stop time, and what I call that amplitude. So that just, I think the number of time I've observed exactly the same the same event in the same context. And the pathogen was just a, a case class just to wrap those two. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So I guess the, the, the other Prego program is, is, is actually getting these pathogen weighted edges back? You know, uh, when you run it forward and reverse, is that what happens? The Prego, so propagate causality, so I know I initially, my first PLC was just simply to page rank, but page rank completely ignores the weight of those, these attributes. It's just simply looking at in, inbound and outbound connections. Okay. So what I'm doing is I, oh gosh, send to every node sent to its neighbor, its actual weight. And then I can start aggregating those different weights. Yeah. It's a sort of 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 uh, it's a sort of page rank. It's a sort of of centrality measure. Yeah. Um, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, I think it. we can formalize this. I, I have a suspicion this is actually a, 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 a weighted version of page rank. Because in page rank, you have a simple random walk because you choose all the outgoing edges uniformly at random with probability 8.85. This yeah. is actually a weighted random walk. Uh, but don't worry about this part because you have only five minutes. Uh, there is a good chance that it may it may not necessarily converge. I don't know if, if I've normalized it exactly the right way. 
But this is exactly that. This is a weighted page rank, a weighted random walk. But also, do you need it to converge? Could you just wait wait for a certain number of, uh, you know, uh, what are they? Oh, you could. Called? You could. Synchronous parallel steps. You could, but in theory, in theory, it was designed to converge after a specific number of steps here. Okay. And then you could potentially pass a, a, a really large graph with different uh, number of connected components, right? Yes. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Okay. That's even more brilliant. Uh, how many minutes do you have? Two minutes. So, so what else? Okay. So Gdout. I didn't have I didn't have the community detection here. That's just given a graph and just propagate. I just explore those causal links and then propagate that risk so that you end up with a graph with every concept as a risk associated to it, a risk of aggressiveness and a risk of sensitivity. Uh, you can start linking that back to a community detection. And, and I can redirect you to a fantastic book called Mastering Spark for Data Science. Yeah, we have we a hard copy wrote. in the lab, you know. Uh, but, <laughs> and we but, have uh, a but community. Antoine, yeah. Okay, you, you, uh, you said you have a hard stop in one minute. So, uh, you know, going back to trend calculus, right? So we have basically taken the foreign exchange one minute data for how many tickers, how many foreign exchange tickers, girls? Uh, 66, all of them. Yeah, so euro, US dollar will be interesting now, for example. So we have all of those. And then the way we are actually envisioning them is a multivariate time series, right? With this arbitrary order uh, reversal points. By that, Andrew, I just mean like when you're currently in, in present time. Can you hear me still? Yeah, you're, you're kind of breaking up a bit, but yeah. Yeah, so when you're video. in current time, uh, basically, we want to know every highest order reversal in the past, right? Every every order up to, so yeah. So that's what I mean by uh, exhausting the past completely, right? So all orders are done. Your recursive trend calculus gives us an empty set. Uh, so we have the full history. And then say we color all these uh, different orders in different colors, and we have uh, 60 odd time series in parallel doing this, right? So then we want to construct this, this pathogen thingy from this. So if you just do it naively, we need to have some notion of, of time, right? The impact time. So are these intervals, how are these time intervals coming for us, say a higher order event in US versus uh, US dollar versus Euro and US dollar versus gold, for example? Okay, so just on trend calculus, it's a lagging indicator. That means that if the high on Bitcoin four or five days ago came in, it takes you 20, say, days to find that, that that was a major high on Bitcoin. So that would be the interval, right? Ah, got it, got it, got it, got it. So essentially, you know, when something happens in the past and then you're going into the future, and as you go into the future, the particular events automatically get higher and higher orders, right? Yeah, and so because the market place the marketplace is watching it confirm yeah right so obviously you want maybe add a little buffer there i think you need to turn off your video Raz, so that your connection doesn't suffer <laughs> good idea okay um, so yeah important concept as well that i just forgot to add how do you align those different events in time so if an event has a timestamp it's fairly difficult to be able to align different timestamps uh, together. So the first thing of that graph is being able to align all those different timestamps. And you can start passing a, frequen a frequency or granularity. So if you're dealing with microsecond time series and you need to be able to start effectively rounding those milliseconds at the milliseconds to be able to say, okay, those two events happen at the same time, or I start creating that overlap based on the millisecond granularity all the way to this is what could happen at a year granularity. So that's, you need to understand the kind of, of, of granularities of the events that you are trying to contextualize together. And you... Oh. <laughs> 
somehow in the code, I'm using those type of function to be able to round a timestamp to the previous tick and then generate a tick during that entire interval to be able to link those events together. I guess each event has a, a, a frequency value that's passed in IC. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's just one, one aspect that was quite difficult here. So whenever you see some date manipulation, it's part of the same package here, date utils. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Can I jump in with a question before you go? Please. So um, you had these, uh, if I, then yeah, I'm, I'm a little behind because I showed up late, unfortunately, but um, language, uh, which I think about causality. And to me, uh, this randomization process is sort of like, uh, it's like a, it's a godly intervention, right? It's, uh, you're saying that you can redistribute when things happen in time. And, and now you're going to try and compare this, this synthetic interventional distribution with your observed distribution and use this to estimate. No. I think you had two measures that you were talking about. The first was, I think, causal sensitivity. Was that correct? Yes. And this one, I, if I understood correctly, the idea was you do this, this synthetic intervention, and then you use this to estimate the presence of a causal arrow in your graph. And I was wondering if this causal sensitivity measure, like what's, how, how, how is this defined? Like what, what exactly is this? Is this supposed to be like how we actually estimate a causal effect in a typical interventional, like a randomized controlled trial setting? How, how are you computing this? Uh, so the, the first, the causal, the causal link from one node to another, it's a simple measure based on signal over noise ratio. When I start creating all that randomized graph and I just look at the likelihood of those two events to co-occur mm -hmm. compared to all those random scenarios. So that's just to be able to extract the causal link from one event to another. Okay. But the page rank is to be able to start propagating that. So there is all that propagation from each causal link up and down that graph to start understanding the likelihood, the likelihood of that node to fail or the likelihood of that. Oh, no. OK, so right. So once you establish the causal link, you're just looking at the ratio of how often these events co-occur versus how often they, uh, they uh, Randomly uh, happens. Randomly, so yes. I, Imagine that we had random roosters crowing all day long. We would never yeah, assume yeah. that some. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I see that. So, but then the aggressiveness measure is this. So, to me, this is now you're no longer so identifying the causal arrow and looking at this first ratio. You're measuring the the direct causal effect of these two events. Now, aggressiveness measure is you're trying to get some sort of uh, you're you're trying to understand. So now, now, now I have a single event and I'm looking downstream at all of these, uh, at all possible events that it could affect in the causal graph. And I'm trying to take an aggregate measure of, its, it, of all of its possible that be, indirect causal effects. Is that I'll correct? Put it. Oh no. Well, completely system down. In, in a big company, if I take a phone system down, everyone's impacted because everyone relies on it, you know? So it's a very aggressive thing to fail because it impacts everybody. Right, but it's a measure here. You're giving me a statistic, right? Well. So I, I guess I was wondering what, what is the actual, I'm a mathematician, so I just want to know that. So, so Liam, Liam our, our problem here is to actually formalize this, right? So we're just trying to understand the code at the moment. Uh, we can formalize this and it's it's uh, it's it's Pregel program. So we can do all, any kind of belief propagation you want. Our main goal is to basically build certain structures. Now we don't have to even go into randomization part right now, uh, but yeah, you're right. But I think that's um, that's definitely a very good question. But I think that's really uh, our task, I would say. 
like like well, formalizing I mean, what I, they're I, doing, but also doing what you think maybe is uh, is is uh, better or more appropriate for certain. Yeah. No, I, it's not that I think anything is better or more appropriate. I find what's happening here extremely interesting. I'm just trying to understand uh, what has been done because maybe there's ways to take what you've already done and make it even stronger from from oh, this other. Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Remember that that was based on a, just a simple discussion, Andrew. Oh, back at them. So clearly, yeah, it's four hours. Clearly, it could be better. Yeah, but it's it's a really it's a really nice idea. I really like this 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 approach. Um, but yeah, so so the phone example, Andrew, is really nice. But what's the actual measure that we get out? What is what is the associated measure? Like, what's the What's the, I, I'm assuming that I get out of a number that tells me the phone's going down, right? Yeah. So, so what, what, what is that? So, so the Andrew, number is that belief propagation that those, those, you can think of that aggregation of all that upstream causal links um, compared to the overall graph. So it's just a normalized score that says this uh, compared to any other concepts are most likely to spread downstream issues. So a firewall will have a much stronger score of aggressiveness than a downstream application only used by one user I see. in the context of IT service management incidents. So the score is not, let's say, a, it's not, it's just consistent with regards to the graph of events that happen. So relative to the rest, this is much higher, much higher page rank, much higher influence. And in fact, I really need to, to, to go, but I was not, to, to give you an idea, remember that hackathon, Cisco incident, I was not allowed to put my results on the slide because I ended up showing to Cisco the top 10 application that will take their entire software defined network down. <laughs> if you want to bring Cisco down, you start in those 10 nodes. That That's will crazy. spread everything downstream. <laughs> that just gives you an idea of the, the power of an analytics like this to be further defined in terms of mathematical measures here, uh, definitely. And this is where you guys come in. I need to yeah. go. Um, Thanks a lot, Antoine. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you Bye. very much. Andrew, are you staying for a few more minutes? I, I am going to stay. And um, if you want, I'll share my screen again. Um, just, yeah, please do. just to show you, uh, if I just hit share there, I go, uh, oops, go back to Google. OK, so what we just to summarize, to put a tail on this, OK? So the first thing was um, that all data comes in archetypes. And when we change their archetypes, we can apply new algorithms to those data sets. So here we've taken time series and trend calculus turns it into a set of events with durations and events, we can connect them into graphs. And now we can apply graph algorithms to time series. Okay, so that's interesting. And the last thing that we didn't get into today is how we turn graphs into causal models that we could then simulate to find out if we change something, what will happen. Okay, so we've been suggesting that we can go from time series to causal models and in this case you know we simply thought well a, a fuzzy cognitive map is is a very simple model that we could build from classes of events and we could use those statistics we found to initialize a fuzzy cognitive map and then to understand two things one if we can validate this map using real data or if it does validate then how we could model how we can make changes and influence the world by going out and changing some of the things and making influence, and then understanding what we think the downstream it causes would um, would create as a as a response. So, just on this, it's maybe not clear if you guys can still hear me um, how powerful this was. So we studied incidents at a big bank for 20, 30 years or something, and at the end, we took all the incidents and found out that. When one system in one country went down, a completely different system in Singapore went down. And then we told the architects, you know, hey, if you go and have a look at the causation candidate rule, 
I think you have a risk to one of the major systems at your entire bank. And it comes from this little, little tiny system in this little corner somewhere. And they were laughing at us. They said, they're not even connected on a network. We said, look, we want you to investigate. And they discovered that the DBA, the database administrator, who worked on that little tiny system also worked on the big system. And that when he went on holiday, the little system was so flaky that it fell over within a day. And then four weeks later, all the log <laughs> files build up. And then the big huge system that does the reserving for the whole bank falls over. Because the guy who was fixing it is on vacation. And it takes four weeks for a big system to fill up and die. And it only takes one day for the small system to fill up and die. So when that came back as an actual risk reduction strategy for the bank is to get holiday cover for John, then we realized that we were discovering causal candidates that were real, that were tangible, that we could take action on, and that we could reduce the risk in the world. And we were finding real things. Yeah, that's great. Andrew, this, this uh, fuzzy cognitive map, that's something else, right? That's not the pathogen stuff. So that's... So Antoine and I were always going to extend pathogen oh, I see. into that next phase, which is to build a real causal model of some type. So, I mean, I can tell you already where it's going to go, at least in the Department of Mathematics at Uppsala. We just got funding for a PhD student in uh, scalable relational artificial intelligence. So uh, she will be actually a complement to uh, Liam and uh, and Albin, so they are doing more like uh, statistical, uh, sorry, more probabilistic uh, stuff. And the other one is, is a model theoretic based um, so thing. And then in it's, but, but the actual algorithms are the same. The ideas are the same. The only difference when, in one particular branch of statistical relational AI is uh, they use this thing called lifted graphical models. And these lifted graphical models are exactly what you're calling as classes, you know, like uh, multiple men and dogs, multiple mo dog men pairs. <laughs> so those are essentially get lifted as a type, event type. So what we are sort of using GDAL for and the cameo codes is actually a way to say, you know, um, a political leader uh, aggressively speaks to another political leader, or whatever, right? These would these would be types of events, for example, that can be lifted in this framework. So, so that's kind of I think where we are going. The reason is because I, I don't know the optimization backend of fuzzy cognitive map, but the nice thing about uh, about the, the lifted graphical models is that they are convex programs with the hinge loss, Markov random field. So it has a very clear probabilistic interpretation, even keeping model theory out for now, Liam. Mm. So, but, but yeah, so the two projects are gonna be, you're here for four more years. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, this new student is only starting in January. So we have like a good four or five years of, uh, of like, you know, continuing this. So we'll, we'll, we'll have more regular meetings uh, at some point, at least once a year uh, for updates. Yeah. But unfortunately, I have to go and uh, finish my assignment in uh, 59 minutes. And then Liam, are we meeting today at six or? or yeah, I'm meeting. I'll head over to the office. Oh, okay. Soon. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. 4 p.m. Yeah. So I, 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 um, I got to run. Are there any questions from you? Uh, uh, any burning questions, uh, Rafaelia or? I'll just leave one comment as well. Um, so Liam, all your questions were you kind of share it. this with the academic community, right? So that you guys can kind of inspect it. The code is written. Um, so if you have more questions, then set up a second session with us. I would, yeah. I would really like to hear more. And I'm, I'm like, I am incredibly sorry that I missed the beginning because yeah. I walked in in the middle of a very interesting discussion. You can watch it in the video, Liam, so no worries. But by the way, they are, the main task uh, for Virginia and, uh, and Wong and, and uh, Rafaelia is next to, uh, you know, to actually try to get or at least one of them, maybe with me or some help from you to get uh, the pathogen code working on the, on the actual, uh, you know, versions. And then trying to load it into a uh, because Spark still allows 211 uh, clusters. I mean, Databricks has those older things still running. So we'll try and play there. And then also the representation of the higher order uh, foreign exchange one minute thing, Andrew, that would be really nice to have one other meeting because their project is supposed to finish before Christmas. <laughs> so they have a tight schedule. So um, thanks again, everyone. Um, and we'll take it. Um, Take it again uh, later. Yep. Bye. Okay. Bye bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you.